Philippians chapter number 2. There's so much preaching in the book of Philippians and so much preaching in this chapter. I want to focus beginning in verse number 5. The Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We're thankful, Lord, you came as a servant. You came as a lamb. You came, Lord, and humbled yourself. You who knew no sin became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in you. Lord, you didn't come with your name on a billboard. You came uh, to be our sacrifice. Lord, we bless you and praise you that we do know you. Lord, we are thankful that there, there's coming a, a day when we'll see you as you are and we'll worship you forevermore. We'll be in glory with you. And Father, all those are attributes that we did not earn or deserve, but they are because of what you've done for us. Now, Father, help us tonight to center our thoughts on you that we might have this mind the mind that you took upon when you put on flesh and came into this world. Bless these thy people, Lord. Some of your choicest saints are here in this sanctuary tonight. Bless them, encourage them. Help us, Lord, to ever draw closer to God. Lord, meet every need of every heart. Be with those that are working with the children on the other side of the building. I pray those children would find the word of God precious. They'd lodge it in their heart and begin to take root. When they reach the age of accountability, I pray they'd come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Thank you that last week we got to baptize four of those children. What a blessing. Yes. Pray for those working with the teens. You'd help them. Those teens are under so much peer pressure. God, I pray you'd help them and you'd bless them. Now, Father, help us, Lord, to sit in heavenly places tonight. Help the enemy just to have to sit back and watch us eat. And God will give you the glory and the honor and the praise for everything. For it's in the name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Amen. I want to draw your attention to these verses. I want you to notice, first of all, the mindset. The mindset. We're talking about the king of glory. We're talking about the one who was altogether lovely, the one who knows everything. Notice his mindset. He said in verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in likeness of men. He said, Have this mind that Christ had, that you realize it's not about you, it's about the will of God. And you have this mindset that you are willing to become broken bread and poured out wine for the brethren like he did, that they might be edified and encouraged. Uh, we live in a day and age uh, where our society thinks it's all about them, me, myself, and I. Give me, give me, give me, give me. You would have never convinced me that even 10 years ago... Uh, we would have a situation in America where we had multiple candidates running for president who were for a socialized government uh, who wanted to do away with democracy uh, and they were gaining, gaining ground and becoming popular uh, because of young people liking the ideal uh, that these politicians says everything is going to be given to you. Uh, these young people haven't lived long enough uh, to realize somebody has to pay for it uh, and they don't realize there's nothing that's free uh, but it's filtered in our churches uh, and we think God's just a big sugar daddy uh, give me, give me, give me, give me I want, I want, I want and we treat God like that kid that I talked about at urgent care uh, we don't get our way, we kick and scream uh, and we want to take our ball and go home and blame God for it all huh? And Jesus didn't come to make himself anything other than a servant. And he said, let this mind be in you. We see the mindset. Notice the metamorphosis in these verses. 
In verse 6 it says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Verse 6, he's in the form of God. In verse 7, he's in the form of a servant, a ser servant in the likeness of men. Now get a hold of this metamorphosis. When Jesus came into this world, he emptied himself of his glory. He's the king of kings. And he emptied himself of that and became a slave. Think about that. Hmm? What a wonderful God we serve. That he's willing. I mean, uh, uh, just willing to look our way would have been something, but he was willing to uh, uh, let his glory slip aside uh, and become like you and I that we might be like him someday. Amen. What a metamorphosis. We see the mindset. We see the metamorphosis. And then notice the meekness in verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. I mean, it wasn't enough that he humbled himself to become a man. But once he became a man, then he humbled himself even more. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. When I'm reading this, and I'm thinking in my finite mind, trying to grasp why a holy God would uh, uh, endure such a thing for such a one as I. And I'm trying to think about why would God do such a thing? Why would he take his glory off? I mean, we do know he walked some 30, uh, 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 three years in this world, and we know uh, uh, after about 32 of them, he took all that he could took, and he went on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he actually shone forth. He, he held it back as long as he could, and finally he just said, uh, boom, and he showed them who he really was, huh? But can I say, why would he put off his glory? Why would he become a man? Why would he humble himself and become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross? What was his motivation? And that's what I want to preach on for a little bit tonight. I want to preach on the motivation of Jesus. What motivated him to do those things? Well, the scriptures makes it pretty clear. Let me give you some verses. In Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8, the Bible says, But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us uh, Galatians 2.20 my life first says I am crucified with Christ uh, nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me uh, and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me uh, Ephesians 2.4 says but God who is rich in mercy uh, for his great love uh, wherewith he loved us uh, Ephesians 5.2 and walk in love as Christ also has hath loved us uh, and given himself for an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Uh, 1 John 3 1 Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us uh, that we should be called the sons of God uh, therefore the world knoweth us not because it knoweth him not. Uh, 1 John chapter 4 verse 9 uh, And this was manifested the love of God toward us uh, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world uh, that we might live through him uh, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. What was the motivation of Jesus? Quite simply, it was love. The only reason Brother Jackie put off his glory and came and died the death of the cross is because he looked ahead in time and loved you. His motivation, Brother Tony, is he loved you. Huh? You've had a lot of things go wrong in your life, but you know the greatest thing that ever happened to you? You realize Jesus loved you. Huh? Clint, he loved you. Huh? Melissa, he loved you. Christina, he loved you. His motivation, Brother Brian, is he saw a hippie punk bike rider one day, and he loved you. He said, I'll set my glory aside. I'll go and become a man. I'll humble myself. And I'll go and die the death of the cross because Brother James, uh, he loved you and wanted to hear you sing about him. Yeah. Hmm? His motivation was love. Can I say, you can see in the life of Christ his motivation fulfilled. We can see that he was motivated by his love for the Father. Throughout his ministry, he made it clear he came to do the will of his Father. 
But in John chapter 14, verse 31, he said this, but, the, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do arise and let us go hence. Make no mistake, Jesus was motivated because his love for the Father. Uh, 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 you know what you and I ought to do? Uh, if we let this mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus, uh, yes, we ought to become a servant to God. Uh, yes, we ought to humble ourselves before God. Uh, but our motivation won't be pure if we don't do those things out of love. Uh, and friends, uh, our love for the Father ought to be demonstrated in our lives. Mm. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know why Jesus did exactly what the Father's will was? Because he loved the Father. Mm. Jesus was our example. We're to love the Father. You know why some folks don't come back to church on Sunday night? Not everybody. Some are providentially hindered. Some I, I, I have to work. Some I have other things. But you know why the vast majority only show up Sunday morning after Sunday morning after Sunday morning after Sunday morning? Because they don't love God like they should. Just be honest. I much rather preach on Sunday night and Wednesday night than Sunday morning, even though the crowd's bigger on Sunday morning. But Sunday night and Wednesday night's crowd that comes out because they love God. Wow. Hmm? Amen. There's always more liberty. Yes. Hmm? Wow. Jesus was motivated by his love for the Father. Can I say this? He was motivated by his love for his followers. He took care of them for three and a half years, but not only those, he looked ahead in time and all those that would follow after him. The Bible says this in Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church uh, and gave himself for it. Uh, he loved you and I, and he gave himself for you and I because uh, uh, of his desire for us to be like him one day. Uh, John 15, 9, he says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Uh, our motivation ought to be the love of Christ. It amazes me what some Baptist churches are built on. Some are built on fear. If you don't do everything that they say the way you're supposed to do it, then they'll, they'll cast you out. And boy, they put people in fear. People are afraid to bow their nose. They're afraid to sing. They're afraid to testify. They're afraid to say amen. They're afraid to uh, uh, go anywhere or do anything or say anything. I'm glad when he saved me, he set me free. I'm not under bondage anymore. Uh, uh, hey, uh, what a blessing uh, 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 to understand and have a balance in my life. Uh, I don't live in fear anymore. I did that as a lost person. Uh, but being saved, I live as unto Christ. Uh, a lot of churches are built on fear. There are a lot of churches built on law. Wow. Thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt. Better get my uh, permission before you do it any. Anyway. Wow. It's all about the law. Yep. And preacher after preacher tries to outdo preacher under the law being meaner than the next guy. But I'm glad Jesus fulfilled the law. Yes. Let me help you something. If the law could save us, Jesus wouldn't have had to come. Hmm? Hey, I haven't met anybody could keep the first ten, let alone the other six hundred and some odd ones that follow. But Jesus fulfilled them. I don't have to keep the law. Oh, the law was my school master. The law uh, taught me uh, 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 and brought me to the knowledge of sin. Uh, uh, the law showed me that I couldn't save myself. Uh, but thanks be unto God, a Savior came uh, who kept the law. Uh, who has said, all you got to do is put your faith in me. Well, their church is built on fear. Their church is built on the law. Then there are churches that are, that are built on nothing. Anything goes. Oh, built on nothing. You start sharing scripture to them, and it they, they just makes their mind go. Because they have no idea what you're talking about. They're built on nothing. Thanks be unto God for a church that's built on truth. And Jesus came full of grace and truth. And thanks be unto God for a church that is motivated by love. Amen. You know, the only indictment they had against Jesus that stuck is that he was the friend of sinners and publicans. You know what indictment the world ought to be able to throw at us and stick? All oh, too many times they have a bunch of folks are hypocrites, and unfortunately that sticks in a lot of cases. But you know, the only thing I ought to be able to say about us is that we love sinners. Mm. Good. We ought to love sinners. Huh? 
Let me help you with something else. We ought to love saved sinners. I got news for you. Saved folks aren't perfect. Huh? We ought to love them. We ought to love the, the vilest of the most vile. We ought to love innocent sinners. Uh, little children. We ought to love them. Tell them about Jesus. But we ought to be motivated by love. Jesus was. We see his love for the Father. We see his love for the followers. But you know what we don't consider very often? Jesus was motivated by his love for his foe. Over there in Matthew, or I'm sorry, in John chapter 13, the Bible says, And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Let me set the scene. Jesus has the last supper. He said, one of you is going to betray me. Afterwards, Satan enters into Judas. And then something real remarkable happens. Jesus announces he's going to wash his disciples' feet. And he girds himself with a towel, and he gets down and he washes his disciples' feet. Now, you know Peter. Peter's a hothead and pop off at the mouth. And he said, no, Lord, I need to wash your feet. And the Lord told him, said, Peter, if you don't let me wash my feet, you're not going to have any part with me in the kingdom. Peter said, wash my feet, wash my head, wash everything, Lord. Just let me, let me have it. Soak me up. But he washed those disciples' feet. You know who else's feet he washed? Judas Iscariot's. How about that? Knowing that Judas is going to betray him. Yeah. Wow. Right. He got down and he washed Judas' feet. You know why? Because he loved Judas. Yeah. I want to tell you, up to the point when Satan entered into him, if Judas would have turned to Jesus and repented and asked Jesus to save him, Jesus would have saved him. Yeah. Right. Hmm? Just a few hours later, Judas is going to kiss him on the cheek. After he tells the soldier, one I kiss, that's, that's him. Comes up and kisses him on the cheek. Jesus doesn't call him a sorry, no good devil. You know what Jesus called him? Wow. Friend. Yep. Wow. Friend. Wow. Jesus even loved his foes. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, he even loved them. And a couple times he got a little rough with them, called them generation of vipers, but he did that because he loved them. No wonder he tells us to love our foes. He told us in Matthew 5, 4, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Boy, that's real easy, isn't it? Bless them that curse you. Well, when somebody runs you down the road, you say, Lord, bless them real good. No, you're asking for the Lord to help them to, to, to run a stop sign and hit a bus. That's what you're asking for. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. When was the last time you did that? Somebody despised you and hates you and you did good to them. Hmm? Then he says, and pray for them which despite, despitefully use you and persecute you. When was the last time you prayed for them? Now, I'm not talking, can you pray God kill them? You prayed God bless them, God help them, God do good by them. You know why Jesus commanded that? Because that's the way Jesus was. And Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. You've got to love your enemies. He said it this way in Luke's gospel, Luke 6, verse 35. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend. He said, lend them money if they need money. Your enemies. Those that talk about you like a sorry, no good. He said, give them some money. Hoping for nothing again. Don't even ask for it back. He said, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Jesus was motivated by his love for the Father, for his followers, and for his foes. Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Are you motivated by love? Am I motivated by love? Do you do what you do around the church house because you love Jesus? Well, I got news for you. There are some people that do it because they want, they want somebody to pat them on the back and tell them what a good job they did. Our motivation ought to be love. Hmm? We ought to make sure our church looks so nice because we love the Father, because we love the saints of God, but because we also love sinners. Hmm? Can I tell you, I've been in some Baptist churches. I was embarrassed for them. I'm not talking about churches that didn't have anything. 
I'm, not, I'm talking about churches that had stuff, but they was too tight to spend it. Because they love money more than they love God's house. That went in my notes, but it didn't cost you anything extra. Can I say this? Jesus was motivated by his love for the forsaken, the lost. He came seeking to save that which was lost. He said this in John 3, uh, John three sixteen. You know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He was motivated for lost people. Even the Syrophoenician woman had no right to him. He healed her daughter. Why? Because he loved her. He said, oh, she had faith. He loved her. He honored her faith. He was motivated by love for the lost. Well, we ought to love lost people. You know, it doesn't matter what, what color, what nationality, what side of the tracks people raise. People want the same thing. Everybody wants to be loved and accepted. The reason some lost people act out the way they act out is they're really seeking attention. We ought to love lost people. Hmm? If the church really loved like it should be, people would flock to it. Why do you think every time Jesus went somewhere, there was a multitude bumping into him? Say, he was so charismatic. It was more than that. He just loved them. No one ever spoke like he did. No one ever did the things he did. You know why he did that? He spoke that way and did what he did? Because he loved them. How many people would flock around here if we just let people know we loved them? Hmm? I thought about this, Jesus. He was motivated by his love for the fallen, the prodigals. He was so concerned about it, he gave that story of the prodigal son. I'm not going to read it. You know the story. But when that son came back, when he came to himself, got out of the hog pen, and he came back, he was planning on this big old speech to tell his father, I've sinned against thee, I've sinned against heaven. You know, I'm no more worthy to be thy son. Make me a servant in, in my father's house. He started that spiel. As soon as the father saw him, he ran to him. Huh? Now, I've listened to Baptist preachers. They say, you got to let that boy get all the way back to the porch. That father saw him afar off and ran. And then that father didn't wait for him to repent, tell him all that stuff. The father fell on him and he kissed him and he kissed him and he kissed him. He told the servants, hey, go kill the fatted calf. Bring me a robe. Bring me shoes. Give me a ring for his finger. My son that was lost has been found. My son that was dead, he's alive. Under the law, that boy should have been stoned. That's why the father fell on him. He said, if you're going to throw stones, you've got to, you've got to hit me first. Uh, and could I say, the worst place you could ever find a Jew boy is in a hog pen. That father didn't tell that boy to go get cleaned up and get the hog smell off of him. No, he said, bring my, my robe. Bring the best robe. Bring my robe and put on him. Huh? Bring a ring, bring him shoes. Uh, 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 he said, you don't have to get, you're my son. And he loved him. Yeah. It don't matter where they come from, how, how much sin they've got involved in, how, how wrecked their lives are. They come through them doors, we ought to run and fall on them and kiss them and love on them, let them know we're glad to see them. Yeah. Hmm. There's some in our church, they were in that shape. Yeah. But you'd never know it today, why? Because we didn't judge them, we loved them. Mm. Uh, oh I'm talked about in some circles about being a compromiser and everything else I'd rather meet Jesus being guilty of loving folks than meeting Jesus being guilty of throwing stones at people uh, you name one person that's worthy to walk through them doors none of us Thank God for grace. Thank God for tender mercy. Thank God for long-suffering. Thank God that he loved us. And can I say, his motivation was love. And Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We ought to be motivated by love. You want to you wanna change your life? Just start loving folks. Hmm? Love your co-workers. Love your neighbors. Bless God, love your church members. Uh, 
Just love people in spite of people. Say, they don't deserve it. You didn't deserve God's love. Right. Right. Hmm? Just love people and watch and see if your life doesn't change for the better. You never go wrong loving people. And when we love people, we're the closest to God as we can, ever can be. Amen. For God is love. Hmm? God help us to be motivated the same way Jesus was. Because when you're motivated by love, you'll leave where you're comfortable at or you'll leave where you're accepted at to go where you might not be accepted at to make a difference in somebody's life. He left glory to come here because he loved us. He sacrificed himself for love. He loved sinners. Even while they nailed him to the cross and he was suspended between heaven and earth, he cried, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Oh, what manner of love the Father hath loved us. Amen. Uh, God help us to be motivated by love. Love people in spite of people. Because when we let this mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus, he'll be pleased. And there's no telling what he'll do in our midst and in our lives. You want to see revival? Start loving people. I'm convinced two things will bring revival. Loving folks the way Jesus loves folks and being grateful and thankful for Jesus for loving us. If we truly become thankful and truly start loving the way Jesus is, we'd have the revival that we, can, we can't even imagine. Revival stopped by judgmental people and ungrateful people. Give us a house full of folks that are thankful and that love like Jesus loves. And we'll turn the world upside down, friend. Because that's what people really want. They want to be loved. They want to be accepted. Just like you wanted to be loved and you wanted to be accepted when Jesus found you in some garbage dump somewhere. Amen. Thank God for the love of God. Yes. And we being recipients of it, where much is given, much is required, we are required of God to love others. God help us to love like we should. God help us to encourage people and help people and be good to people in so doing we just might win some people and that's what it's all about getting folks to Jesus you know how we'll get, him to, get them to him acting like Jesus they'll want to know our Jesus God help us to love and be motivated by love let's all stand I'm done brother Ray come get a song of invitation maybe you want to come thank God for loving you Maybe you want to come and ask God to put somebody in your life that you can show the goodness of God to and love on. Maybe tonight you just want to come and tell Jesus how much you love him. Maybe tonight the Lord's put somebody on your heart that's in the sanctuary. You need to go tell them you love them. I don't know. Maybe you need to go tell somebody, thank you. But I know one thing. You never go wrong minding God. So folks are coming. Brother Ray's getting a song. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. Lord, help the underlying motivation of our life be the love of God and help us to express it to others. Help us, Lord, to love you the way we ought to. And God, help us to be thankful and appreciative for your good grace. Now, blessing this invitation, folks have come. Bless, meet every need of every heart and life. God, you know what's needed. Help folks mind God in this invitation. We'll bless you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.